Hello, my name is Dr. Michael Rothman, and this is my assistant, Noel, and we have some great news to tell you. You don't have to be sick. You don't have to be fat. You don't have to suffer from high blood pressure or diabetes. You don't have to experience aches and pains and bowel problems and headaches. You can take control of your health and your life simply by doing the right things. Wait a minute, Dr. Mike. Don't most diseases run in your family? Yes, Noel. Every disease runs in your family, and every disease has a genetic component. But the thing is, that doesn't mean that you have to have these diseases just because they do run in your family. And in fact, inflammatory bowel disease runs in my family. And over 30 years ago, I was diagnosed with having Crohn's disease, which is a type of inflammatory bowel disease. And the doctors told me that I would be sick my whole life, that I would need medications my whole life, that I would be at high risk for cancer, that I may need to have part of my bowel removed, and maybe even walk around with a bag on my side called a colostomy bag. Wow, that must have been terrifying. It was very scary, Noel. And in fact, I noticed that when I was scared, my symptoms were much worse. And then when I was calm, my symptoms were better. For a while, I tried to take the medication that the doctors prescribed for me, and it didn't really seem to make that much difference. But I always noticed that when I was more relaxed, things were better, and then if I was anxious, things got worse. And I remember one day distinctly waking up and feeling lousy again and thinking to myself, you know what, I don't want to be sick anymore. I'm tired of this. And I looked over at this bottle of pills on my counter and I said, you know what, the answer to my problem is not in this bottle of pills. The answer is inside of here. That if I could just learn how to control my emotions and my anxiety, that I could, I could learn to, to be healthier. And if I just did the right things, then I would be okay. Do you still have Crohn's disease, Dr. Mike? Well, you know, no, well, it's still there. And if I don't take care of myself really, really well, my symptoms could come back. So I need to make sure that I can control my stress and um, that I, I take really good care of myself. But even one lousy meal could really make me sick. No wonder why you're such a fanatic about your diet. I'm not really a fanatic. I just do what I have to do because, well, that's what I have to do in order to, to be healthy. And you know, that's what this show is all about. And that's why I decided to go to medical school because I wanted to teach other people that they didn't have to be sick, that if they just did the right things, that they can be healthy. And so please tell your friends, your family, your loved ones, anybody that you care about that they need to watch the show because you're gonna hear things here that you're not gonna hear anywhere else. And the bottom line is that you don't have to be sick. Have you ever noticed that your mom's always right when it comes to your health? Your mom will say, don't go out in the rain without a hat or you'll <laughs> catch a cold. And sure enough, what do you do? You go out in the rain, you don't wear a hat, and then you catch happens. a cold. You catch a cold, yeah. So how does your mom know these things? Well, this sort of information has been passed down from generation to generation, from mother to daughter and daughter to granddaughter. And these things have been known, they're called old wives' tales. And there's a lot of old way of wives' tales out there. There's things like, don't crack your knuckles or they'll get big and you'll end up with arthritis. Or um, don't make that face. It'll get stuck that way. My mom's favorite is don't go swimming for about an hour after you eat or you'll get a stomach ache. That's a very famous old wives tale, <laughs> Noel. In fact, probably the most famous one of all. So why do you think your mom says this to you? Um, so that I have a chance to digest my food before I exercise? Exactly. But let's look at the scientific reasons behind what your mother is saying. In order to understand this, we need to understand something called the autonomic nervous system. And this is a system in your body that essentially controls every organ in your body. And there's two parts of the system. One part is called the sympathetic nervous system. It's also known as the fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. And let me give you an example of the fight or flight response. Imagine you're walking down the street and all of a sudden you see a grizzly bear. Well, what do you think would happen? Um, I'd be really scared so my heart rate would go up. Exactly. Your heart rate would go up. But so many other things happen at the same time during this fight or flight response. Adrenaline will start pouring out of your adrenal glands, your adrenal medulla to be specific, and your pupils will get bigger. Why? So, well, you can see in the dark. It'll help you survive that fight with the grizzly bear running away. Mm -hmm. Your blood sugar is going to go up to give you energy to run away from the grizzly bear. Your nose will dry up so that you can breathe better. Your bronchioles will expand so that you can breathe better. There's other things. Your, your digestion will stop working because, well, frankly, you don't need to be digesting your lunch when you're running from a grizzly bear. <laughs> so there's so many things that happen at the same time. So it's kind of like my body's a car, and SNS is like the gas pedal fueled by adrenaline. Yes, yes. The 
fight or flight response, the sympathetic nervous system, is almost like a gas pedal on your physiology. But it's not just adrenaline that can actually affect the sympathetic nervous system. Other things, for example, any stimulant, like if you drink coffee, that's a stimulant. That'll stimulate your sympathetic nervous system. Um, thyroid hormones sti stimulate your sympathetic nervous system. There's certain minerals like calcium and phosphorus. These will stimulate your sympathetic nervous system. The flip side of this, if you have low levels of certain things, that can stimulate your fight or flight response. For example, if your potassium is too low, if your magnesium is too low, if your blood sugar is too low, all of these will stimulate your sympathetic nervous system. Now, you mentioned there's a gas pedal, and when there's a gas pedal, well, you better have a break. And that break is called the parasympathetic nervous system. And this does the exact opposite as to the sympathetic nervous system. It slows down your heart rate. It makes your pupils smaller. It increases the mucus in your nose. It lowers your blood sugar, lowers your blood pressure. So all of these things occur under the influence of the parasympathetic nervous system. But let's get back to the original thing that we were talking about, which is old wives' tales. So here you go, you're eating lunch, and then all of a sudden, a short while later, you I jump in the pool, which activates my SNS, which stops my digestion at the same time, so then I end up with a stomach ache. Exactly, Noel. Wow, you're very astute about this. Yes, that's exactly what happens. And so the lesson to be learned here is that when you start to eat, you activate a whole series of physiological responses that help you digest your food. And these are all facilitated through the parasympathetic nervous system. And if you interrupt that, that function with some sort of activity that stimulates your sympathetic nervous system, you can end up with all sorts of problems. But there's other activities that really require parasympathetic activity. For example, have you ever noticed that you had trouble sleeping if you've been studying too hard or thinking too much? Or I always notice that when I work out at night, I have such a hard time falling asleep. Well, that's exactly the same thing, yes, because when you work out, you exercise, you're stimulating your sympathetic nervous system, and that's going to impair your ability to sleep because that requires parasympathetic nervous system activity. Is that also why, like, if I eat too much, my nose starts to run? Yes, well, runny nose is a parasympathetic symptom. Mm -hmm. And so the lesson to be learned here, Noel, is that every time you eat, you're going to activate your parasympathetic nervous system, and you, and you must allow this process to occur. And so your nervous system has to be coordinated properly for things to function well. And um, you need to separate your parasympathetic activity from your sympathetic activity. Otherwise, you're going to end up with all sorts of symptoms. Oh, I get it. Like uh, stomach cramps or trouble sleeping. Dr. Mike, are you trying to tell me that my mother knows how the ANS works? Well, I don't know if she really understands the autonomic nervous system, but moms are pretty smart. And over the generations of passing information down from one generation to the next, they've come to the conclusions of how we can be healthy and what makes us a, a sick. And, you know, if we listen to our mom, then we can really be healthy because your mom's always right. <laughs> so we really need to listen to our moms. And if you do that, if you listen to your mom and some of this advice that has been passed down from generation to generation, then you don't have to be sick. We've all heard the phrase, everything in moderation. But what does that really mean? Um, that I need to keep a balance in my life in order to be healthy and happy. Yeah, but balance where, Noel? In my body, of course. Well, exactly. But you know that we really have three different types of bodies. We have a structural body. For example, this table is, is structural. This chair has structure to it. And we also have other types of parts of our body. We have biochemical bodies and energetic bodies. But let's go back to the structure. So imagine this chair. This chair has four legs, and it's very strong. Why? Because all the legs are even, mm -hmm. and it, it provides stability, and therefore it functions properly. However, can you imagine if one of these legs was shorter than the other, how it'd be, it wouldn't function properly? It wouldn't be as strong. It would break easily, and maybe I would fall off the chair. So you can see that a structural imbalance can really cause a problem if you had a structural imbalance in your body, for example. Oh, that reminds me of the other night. I was in the city and one of my heels broke off. I only walked around for about an hour like that, but the next day I woke up with a terrible headache and backache. Wow, that's a really cool example of a structural imbalance, Noel. Now, can you imagine if you had some sort of functional problem where one of your legs was shorter than the other and you went through your whole life like that? That would hurt. You would have such misery throughout your life. Mm -hmm. First of all, your pelvis would be crooked and then your spine would be crooked and then eventually your spine would be curved. 
you may end up with something like a herniated disc, and then the herniated disc could impair your organs. In other words, your life, your entire life could be a mess simply because you had a mild structural imbalance in your body. And all of these problems can be solved by simply getting a special pair of shoes made? Exactly, Noel. So some simple intervention on the structural level can have such a profound effect on your health. Now there's structural modalities, healing modalities, that actually look at these sort of things. For example, orthopedic surgery is a structural modality. The orthopedist will sort of shift your structure around. Other structural modalities th include things like chiropractic and physical therapy. Even massage could be considered a structural therapy. So you can see how in a structural imbalance can lead to all sorts of problems. But what about a biochemical imbalance? So let's, let's consider some biochemical imbalances. So when we talk about biochemistry, what are we talking about? We're talking about hormones and, and minerals and vitamins and amino acids. And Well, let's look at one particular mineral, for example. How about potassium? What would happen if you had a potassium imbalance? See, I've heard that if you don't have enough potassium, you get cramps. If you have too much, you could have other problems as well. Okay, so let's, let's talk about low potassium. So if you have low potassium, you're saying it can cause a cramp. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at that in the context of what we've already learned about the autonomic nervous system. See, potassium stimulates your parasympathetic nervous system. So if your potassium is too low, you'll have excessive sympathetic nervous activity, and that can lead to muscular cramps. There's also a lot of other symptoms that occur with low potassium. Your heart rate could go up. You can end up with constipation. You can end up with anxiety. There's all sorts of problems that can occur with the potassium deficiency. I get it. If my potassium levels are low, my PNS tone will decrease, but at the same time, my SNS will increase. And since they're working against each other, then I will get cramps. Correct. Huh. But how do I get low potassium in the first place? That's a very good question. Why would your potassium drop in the first place? So, well, one thing would be if you're not eating enough potassium in your diet, but also if you're, if you're consuming something that's going to cause a diuretic effect where you eliminate too much potassium. For example, if you drink too much coffee or use diuretic medications. Believe it or not, even drinking too much water can lower your potassium levels because of a hormonal imbalance that, that can cause. Wait a minute, Doc. Are you saying that even drinking too much water can cause a biochemical imbalance in my body, which would cause me to get sick? Yes, Noel, and that's the concept here. Everything in moderation. If you don't have proper balance within your body, you're going to have all sorts of problems. So it's kind of like my plants. If I water them too much, then they drown and they don't grow. But what about an energetic imbalance? Can you give me an example of an energetic imbalance? Yes, Noel. And let's look at your plants again. Other than water, what else do they need to be healthy? Sunlight. Yeah, sunlight. If my plants get too much sunlight, then they burn and they dry up. But if they don't get enough, then they don't grow at all. Exactly, Noel. And you need sunlight as well to be healthy. Sunlight not only creates vitamin D from the cholesterol within the epithelial cells of your skin, but it also goes right into your eyes and affects your brain and your hormones, and it, it really is very beneficial for your overall well-being. I always notice how well I sleep after spending a day on the beach. I sleep like a baby. The reason that you sleep so well at night, Noel, after being in the sun during the day is that sunlight actually raises your melatonin levels. So if you get proper sunlight during the day, your melatonin levels will rise when you're at, at night and you'll sleep so much better. And here's the bottom line, Noel, and, and the, and the take-home message. Too much sunlight causes sunburn. Not enough sunlight is very, very bad for you. And so you want to have a proper balance of everything. And so we need proper balance. We need proper balance on the structural level. We need proper balance on the biochemical level and we need proper balance on the energetic level if you want to be healthy. And therefore, any healing modalities, if they're going to be effective, have to help us rebalance ourselves. Wow, Noel, yes, that's a great conclusion, yes. So if we can get and achieve balance on our structural levels, our biochemical levels, and our energetic levels, it'll really facilitate our health. And in every episode of the show, we're going to talk about different modalities, structural modalities, or biochemical modalities, or energetic modalities that fit our model, and we want to see how do these fit in, and how can they facilitate our wellness. And if you're able to do this, and use these modalities correctly, then you don't have to be sick. We've all heard the phrase, the truth is stranger than fiction. And the more I learn about the human body and health and disease, the more I realize that this is true. 
You know, we live in such an incredible world with just such beautiful things like rainbows and exotic creatures, the aurora borealis. There's just so many fantastic things in this world. However, there's also a lot of dangerous things. There's earthquakes and floods and viruses and fungus and bacteria and all sorts of grizzly bears and all sorts of things that are very dangerous. And believe it or not, every symptom that you experience is actually your body trying to defend itself against this hostile environment. Wait a minute, Doc. Are you saying that some of these symptoms are actually beneficial? What about sweating, shivering, coughing, sneezing, bouts of diarrhea, vomiting? Those can't possibly be good. That's exactly what I'm saying, Noelle. Yes, these are all in some ways good for you and helping to protect your body. And let's take each one of these and see how this is actually beneficial. Let's start with the cough and the sneeze. So imagine that you get some dust in your nose or some particle in your throat. Well, you're going to cough it out or sneeze it out. That's actually a good thing because it'll protect your airways. How about shivering? Well, if your body's cold, it means your temperature is too low and you need to raise your body temperature. So what does your body do? It actually starts to shiver, which creates energy, and that energy raises your body temperature. Now, what about sweating? Well, sweating occurs when you're too hot. So when you sweat, there's moisture goes on your skin. And when that moisture evaporates, the heat is dissipated and your body temperature is lowered. Mm -hmm. What about vomiting and diarrhea? Well, imagine you ate something that's really bad for you, that's poisonous. Well, rather than absorbing those things in your body, it's certainly better for you to get rid of that stuff quickly, either through vomiting or through a bout of diarrhea. So yes, every single symptom can be beneficial to a certain degree. So it's kind of like these symptoms are our body's attempt to rebalance itself. Almost like sort of a reflex, right? Yeah, like a reflex. Yes. You know, let's demonstrate some reflexes to show how these reflexes can actually protect your body from harm. The first reflex I want to demonstrate is something called the blink reflex. Now, that's almost like a startle reflex, but yes, notice that, that you blink, it's involuntary. Now, what is useful about that is because if you had to think, oh my God, there's a hand coming, I better close my eye, by the time you actually thought that, it's too late and your eye would be injured. So the blink reflex actually will protect your eye from damage. The next reflex I want to demonstrate is called a <coughs> pupillary reflex. And if I shine light into your eye, the pupil will get smaller, and then if the, in the dark, your pupil gets bigger. Now, how does this protect you? Well, too much light can actually injure your retina. So when the light's too bright, your pupil will get smaller to protect your retina from damage. On the other hand, if it's dark, your pupils will get big, well, so that you can see in the dark, and this protects you from falling and hurting yourself. The next reflex I want to demonstrate is something called the gag reflex. Mm -hmm. And no, I'm going to apologize in advance because <laughs> this is a little bit obnoxious. Okay, so if I take this tongue depressor and I put it in your throat, and, I bring it, and you start to gag. Now, so this is sort of obvious, right? So if you're choking, the gag reflex keeps you from actually swallowing some foreign material and keep you from save your life, basically, right? Mm -hmm. The next reflex I want to demonstrate, if you can just put your legs out a little bit, is something called the deep tendon reflex. And if I tap right here, we can see that you have some reflexes there. Maybe not in this one. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you should see a doctor about that, Noel. But how, you may think to yourself, well, how the heck could this actually protect me from harm? And what happens is when I tap your knee here, it actually stimulates your quadricep muscle to flex. But at the same time, the muscles on the opposite side of your leg, your hamstrings, actually relax. So whenever you have a reflex like this, if you had to make a sudden motion, one muscle group will flex and the other one will relax at the same time. And so if you have to make a sudden motion, this will keep you from injuring yourself. So this is a very, very important reflex. So every single reflex actually is protecting your body from harm. So you understand now, Noel, so each reflex is going to help you protect yourself. Well, I see how those reflexes can be beneficial, but what about constant pain? How can pain be beneficial to me? Well, Noel, pain's actually a signal that you're hurting yourself. So it's telling you, hey, whatever you're doing, you better stop this right away because you're causing damage. Now imagine that you had no sensation in your hands, that you have some sort of neurological problem, and you touched a hot stove. And instead of removing your hand, you kept it there. Well, you would end up burning your hand. And so you can see that this, this is really actually a good thing. Oh, so it's sort of like if I twist my ankle, it'll really hurt, which will tell me, don't walk on that foot. 
or I'll make it worse. Exactly. Not only that, if you twist your ankle and sprain it, your ankle will swell up. And that swelling is actually beneficial because it acts almost like a splint or a, or a cast, which will immobilize your ankle and keep it from, from getting worse. Okay, I get it, Doc, but what about people who always feel pain or always feel sleepy? How is that beneficial? Well, that means that there's some signal that's being sent to them that they're just not listening to or they're not abiding by. Let me give you an example. Have you ever heard of gluten allergies? Yeah. Okay. Gluten allergies are pretty common. About 25% of the adult population are allergic to these, these proteins that are in wheat. So imagine that you have this gluten allergy and you eat wheat and then the next day your hands swell up and you have aches and pains all over your body. But you don't realize that it was the gluten that did this to you. So instead of not eating glutens, you just simply take some pain medicine. What do you think is going to happen then? Oh, just continue to consume gluten and I won't feel anything anymore because I'm taking pain medications but still I'll be damaging my joints. Exactly, Noel. But even worse than that, if you set off your immune system with something that you're allergic to, not only will it cause joint damage, but it can, believe it or not, lead to things like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, anxiety, depression, pretty much any symptom. So are you saying, Doc, that any unrecognized food allergy can cause basically any disease? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, Noel. Not only food allergies, but there's other things in your environment that you may be allergic to as well. Things like dust or mold. And so it's really, really important. And that's the lesson here, that you need to listen to your body. If you're experiencing symptoms, you don't want to just take some medication to cover them up. Any symptom that you have is actually your body trying to heal itself. And so we need to listen to your body. And, and if you can, you can find out what is causing your problems, then, and then you can eliminate these things from your internal and external environment, then you don't need to be sick. You may have heard that stress is bad for you. You've probably heard that stress has been linked to things like high blood pressure, diabetes, depression. Stress is really, really bad. And in this segment, I like to define what stress is, why it is so bad for you, and then offer some tips on reducing your stress. So first of all, Noel, how would you define stress? Um, I guess I define stress as having a lot of work or getting into a fight with someone in your family or a friend. Well, that's a type of stress. And what you just described is what I would call situational stress. But there's, I'd like to expand the definition of stress beyond just the situational stuff. And I'd like to define stress as anything, any substance or activity or environmental condition that comes into your internal or external environment that causes your body to defend itself against that particular stress. You know, even your own thoughts can be stressful. So what you're saying, Doc, is that stress is anything real or imagined that comes into my environment, or it can be. Yes, Noel. And the thing that you must understand is that every time you're stressed out, your body will put out stress hormones to help you combat this stress. And if you have too many stress hormones, things like cortisol or adrenaline, while they may be beneficial in the short term, the long term, effects of excessive stress hormones are really devastating to your health. Because it goes against the idea of everything in moderation. Exactly, yes. But to make things even worse, that over time, your body can actually run out of stress hormones, and this can lead to all sorts of problems as well, lead to all sorts of symptoms. Like what? Basically, Noel, if you have too many stress hormones or not enough stress hormones in your body, mm -hmm. it can pretty much lead to any symptom. But specifically, we'll see people have terrible allergies, fatigue, allergic reactions. I have allergies, and one time I had such a bad allergic reaction, I was rushed to the ER, where my doctor gave me a steroid called prednisone. You know, if you came to see me in the emergency department with a bad allergic reaction, absolutely, I would give you most likely some sort of steroid or some form of adrenaline, in addition to Benadryl, mm -hmm. to help your body combat that type of stress. So if I'm under too much stress, my adrenal glands, they put out adre adrenaline over and over again until I run low. Right. And well, that's the thing. Now, if, you, if you're under too much stress all the time, your body will actually run out of these stress hormones. It's sort of like running out of money in your bank account. Oh, 
So when I'm under too much prolonged stress, I'm kind of like a drunken sailor, frivolously spending money until I run out and then I have to pay back my debts in the form of uh, symptoms, so to speak. Exactly, Noelle. So the thing is, Noelle, if you're under too much stress for too long, your body's going to first put out too many stress hormones, and then after a while, you're going to end up running out of stress hormones. And these hormones come from your adrenal glands, which are little glands that sit right on top of your kidneys. And so, I mean, one of the key things then is to, to try to reduce your stress. Well, how do I reduce my stress and spare my, kid, uh, spare my kidneys and my adrenal glands? Well, the thing is you need to identify what things are stressing you. Where is the stress coming from? Do you have stress on your structural level? Is there stress on your biochemical level? Is there some sort of energetic stress? So we need to identify that stress and then try to eliminate it as best we can. And that leads us to tonight's Stress Busters tip. Well, we're all familiar with the old wives' tale. Early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. You've heard that one, right? Yeah. Imagine that you're up too late. You're doing something. You're watching TV or doing your homework or talking to your friend. And you stay up way too late. And now you oversleep. And you, you wake up in the morning, you're frantic. You're, oh my God, I'm going to be late for work. And instead of sitting there enjoying a nice, healthy breakfast, you go, oh my God, you throw some clothes on, you reach into the refrigerator and grab some stuff out of there. You jump in your car. And then instead of having a nice, relaxing ride in the car, listening to the radio, talking to your friend, you're sitting there going, oh my God, I'm going to be late. You're cursing out every slow driver in front of you. You're going, oh my God, there's another red light. You're thinking about all the things that you have to do when you get to the office or to school, whatever it is. By the, by the time you get to where you need to be, you're already exhausted. So you're saying that I can reduce my stress just by planning ahead and you know, going to sleep early so that I can wake up early? Yes, Noel. And it's really important because if you're stressed out and you're depleting your stress hormones, you can end up with all sorts of symptoms. Now I understand why my allergies are always so much worse when I don't get a good night's sleep, don't eat healthy, and don't take good care of myself in general. I'm making too many withdrawals from my metabolic bank account, and my reserves are just too low. Exactly, Noel. If you just waste away your metabolic reserves by poor planning and having all this situational stress, it can have a devastating effect on your health. So this is an important tip. And in every episode of the show, we're going to give you a, a wonderful stress busters tip, which will help you reduce your stress on the structural level, the biochemical level, and the energetic level. And if you're able to do this and reduce your stress, then you're going to be so much healthier. You're going to get healthier every day and stronger. And then you don't have to be sick. So who are you going to call? Stress busters? <laughs> Wow, that was such a great show. I had so much fun, and we learned so much. I learned that my mother does actually know something about staying healthy. Yes, you know, we can all learn from our ancestors and the traditions that have been passed down from generation to generation. And also, uh, all these different traditional healing methods that can help us achieve balance on biochemical, structural, and energetic levels. Yeah, Dr. Mike, being healthy is really all about balancing from the inside out and the outside in. Wow. This information is so important, and it's so much fun to learn about. And you know, it's really crazy how when you start to understand how diseases really work, you figure out how to cure them and how not to be sick. Exactly, Noelle. And you know, the truth is stranger than fiction. Mm. And in every episode of this show, we're going to bring you little-known information that you're not going to hear anywhere else. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching tonight. It's been such a pleasure. And remember, you, you don't, don't have, have to be, be sick. sick.